guys and welcome to lecture number seven I believe today we're going to be talking about the fall of Rome from the crisis of the third century to Emperor Diocletian to Constantine and then eventually you guys will be researching a little bit more how it fell in your homework assignment so we have a lot to cover today but I want to do it a little bit fast so that you guys can spend time reading for yourself how Rome fell in the assignment on Blackboard, which will be your homework. So once again, I've changed the homework assignment from on the syllabus uh, that was, I think, talking about Roman emperors. And now I want you guys instead to read about the fall of Rome. So anyway, let's get started. So I want to begin today by talking about the crisis of the third century. And I want you to remember that the third century really means the year 200s, just like how we're in the 21st century, but we're only in the year 2020. This crisis all began in the year 235 when a Roman emperor, Severus Alexander, was murdered. Severus Alexander wasn't a remarkable empire, emperor, but... The empire had been losing its relevance. So the empire had grown so much that the emperors didn't have a lot of power. They didn't matter as much anymore because when you're trying to control a land so vast that it encompasses from the north up in Britain to parts of Africa to the Middle East... Rome itself in Italy isn't as important anymore. And after Severus Alexander is murdered, we enter in a 50-year period of unrest where the only real government is the military. And the reason why this is, is there is a problem with succession. So succession means what comes after something. To be someone's successor means you come after them. There was a couple different ways that you could have succession. So who would be the next emperor? Our first one is dynastic, as in like a dynasty. So a family line, it's either maybe a father to a son or an uncle to nephew or a father to grandson. And a dynastic cycle just means that it's going to be through, through like your family. There's another way of being chosen by your predecessor. So chosen by the person that's currently leading, the person that came before you. <laughs> so we have the predecessor first and the successor second. Hopefully that makes sense to you guys. And the next is a coup d'etat, a just a takeover of the government, usually by military force. So an example of a coup d'etat would be Julius Caesar or his nephew Augustus. Anyway, during the third century, there was this issue of succession. No one could decide who was going to be the emperor. So over a span of 50 years, 60 Romans proclaimed themselves emperors of Rome. They were usually from the military and they were usually very far away from Rome. So if a man in North Africa, if a Roman soldier in North Africa said, I am the new emperor of Rome, well, maybe someone up in Britain was saying that they're the new emperor of Rome. And this leads to, as you could imagine, so much confusion. So much confusion. The next part is that barbarians, what we called, sacked the city of Rome. So... All of these places that the Roman Empire controlled, as you can imagine, had people living there that were not very happy. They weren't very happy because Rome would collect taxes from them, but then not help their communities. And then imagine, imagine if Albany is Rome, and Albany is going to tax Schenectady, and we're going to have nothing over here in Schenectady, because now we don't even have our own money because it's going to Albany. So barbarians, people from the outskirts or like out in the country of, of the Roman Empire, would come and destroy the city. And as you can imagine, with such a huge empire, 
there's not that many militaries stationed in Rome. The military is out in Judea or like Israel, or the military is up in Britain or the military is in North Africa. So the city of Rome ends up being kind of destroyed multiple times. <laughs> and the next one is that a plague kills millions of people in the entire Roman Empire. So remember, the Roman Empire is not just Italy. It's like I said, it's, it's parts of Europe, into Northern Europe, parts of Northern Africa, into the Middle East. And <laughs> just like how coronavirus has decimated our economy, you could imagine that a plague in any century from 21st to 3rd century ruins the economy. And that's exactly what happened. So in the midst of all of this crisis is Diocletian. And Diocletian was a soldier. He was a general. And he becomes our next ruler from 284 to 305. So Diocletian was just like any of the other men who appointed themselves emperor when they were part of the military. He defeats his rival, and it seems like he's going to be more of the same. Just keeps the unrest going. But Diocletian, though he wasn't a really great general, he was a really great leader and a boss. He was the son of an ex-slave, so he was respected as someone who earned his place in society to go from an ex-slave to a general. And he ends up militarizing society. This affects Rome in a couple different ways. As you could imagine, it protects the frontier. So just like we were worried about the barbaric invasions of Rome, now that we have a stronger military, that's less of a problem. The militarization of society leads to more taxes, but taxes, the way, that, the way that people are taxed, have been fixed. So how would you calculate taxes? If you wanted to tax people for a society and you are in classical Rome, how would you tax them? Income tax is easy for us to do because the government knows how much money I make and I make actual dollars. Whereas in classical Rome, how do we know that a potter is making coin money? What if a potter is making, is, is making his living by trading? I'll trade you this pottery and you will trade me a couple pounds of beef, for example. In Rome, they weren't calculating based on income tax. They were calculating based on land tax. But all land is not created equal, right? Think about the amount of money that could be made on a really luscious farm. Think of maybe an acre, one acre of farmland versus one acre of a swamp. Okay? So the way that they calculate taxes wasn't really effective. Diocletian makes some reforms. And he decides that there will be people to appraise or write down the value of what you have. And this changes every 15 years, which is great. So let's say I'm on a farm and... My main export is wheat and eggs. I have chickens and I have fields. The appraiser or the person that comes to value my farm might say, okay, she has wheat and chickens, so we're going to tax her $1,000 a year. Okay. 15 years later, let's say... It's been a really couple bad years, and my fields are all swamped. My hay is not doing so well. Well, they might come back and say, well, 
Now she only has the chickens, so how about we just tax her $500 instead of $1,000? And this becomes super effective for getting, getting money to then go to the military and just getting money to improve the state of things. Okay? So how does Diocletian fix Rome? There's a couple different ways. The first is the government, which he changes into a tetriarchy. You guys have heard of Tetris, right? Tetris, there's four pieces. So a tetriarchy is a rule of four. Diocletian does something that we will be seeing the effects of for a thousand years. He divides Rome into east and west. Rome had gotten really big, the Roman Empire, and Diocletian saw that it was just too big. Remember I said he was a really good boss and leader? He thought he was going to do the right thing and make it more manageable by dividing it. Well, in the East and West, let's say in the West, there would be two main rulers, and each of those two would choose a, like a helper. So this was Diocletian's attempt to balance, balance power not just having one all-powerful empire emperor, but having a tetriarchy for people to balance the power. He tried to improve the economy. He wanted to have a fixed price for everything throughout the Roman Empire. And this is something that didn't go over very well. Just think about, let's think about America for a second, okay? In Florida, there are a lot of oranges. If you've ever gone to Disney or driven just from the airport to anywhere around Orlando, you'll pass a bunch of oranges, orange uh, farms and stuff like that. So to get an orange here in New York State, it has to be flown or shipped, and that affects the price. It is cheaper to get a, a Florida orange if you're in Florida versus to get an orange here in New York. Diocletian wanted there to be a fixed price for everything. But that doesn't make a lot of sense for Rome, especially because think about the geography for a minute. Think about Britain. And Britain is in the north, it snows, it's cold, it's kind of dreary a lot of the year. And then think about Egypt. <laughs> it's, it's on the border of a desert. So a fixed price for everything was a little bit hard to achieve. But, you know, he tried. And the last thing that he wanted to fix was the frontier. This is the only one that works because, like I said... He militarizes society and uses those new tax collection, uh, the new form of tax collection, to directly help the military. But next we have Constantine. So Constantine comes after Diocletian, and he wants to become the leader. He raises an army in Britain. That's where he was stationed. And he defeats his rival or someone that would have been part of the Tetriarchy, in uh, 312, so three, the year 312, at the Milvian Bridge. And the Milvian Bridge becomes extremely important for pretty much the rest of Western civilization. We're even feeling this effects now, today. So there's two stories about Constantine and the Milvian Bridge. He is about to go into battle with his rival, Maxentius. And they arrive at the Milvian Bridge, which is an important route on the Tiber River, if you guys remember way back to our first conversation about Rome. The Tiber River is a really important central, central body of water to Rome. This is the first story, is that Constantine is about to go into battle, on the night before, he has a dream of an angel. And the angel says that you need to paint this symbol 
on your shields. This is the chi and the ro. The chi or the chai and the ro. These are it's like Latin letters. And Constantine wakes up. He does this. He paints it. And then he goes into battle and wins. The importance of the chi and the ro is that the chi is the X shape and the row, it's supposed to be an R. It looks like a P, but you can imagine if it was an R, it'd be like that. The first letters of Jesus Christ, Christ, is the chi in the row, the K sound. I've only mentioned Christianity at this point. We're going to go back in time a little bit. Our next lecture is going to be back from the 4th century to the 1st century, essentially. At the time, Christianity was not accepted. Okay, so here is a, and I'll get more into that. So here is someone who wants to be an emperor painting a Christian sign on the shields of his army. And then he wins. Very interesting. There's a later version that was from actually Constantine's biographer. So back back in the day, if you were an important person, a biographer would travel with you and write down the things that you do. Apparently, before battle, Constantine is on the other side of the Tiber River, and he sees a cross in the sky, kind of in the middle of the sun like blotting out the sun. And around it are these Latin words that says, in this sign, you will conquer. This is just like the story of the dream of the angel. This is saying, you, a Roman emperor, if you believe in Christianity, you will win. We'll get more to why that. We'll get to why that's important a little bit later. I do want to finish talking about Constantine and the fall of Rome so that you guys can do your homework. So I'm going to go forward. Constantine wins at the Battle of the Milvian Bridge, and he becomes the sole ruler a couple of years later, 12 years later, in 324. The sole ruler, I hear you guys asking, what about the Tetriarchy? Well, that failed. <laughs> Constantine is the sole ruler, but don't worry, that won't last very long because Rome is about to fall in a couple hundred years. This begins the idea of Christian Romans. A Christian Roman used to be an oxymoron, something that doesn't make sense, like jumbo shrimp or a baby grand piano. These are oxymorons. Romans were the ones that killed Jesus, <laughs> okay? Romans did not agree with any of the ideas of Christianity or Jesus. So, I shouldn't say any, but most of the ideas of Christianity and Jesus. So the idea of a Christian emperor in a Christian Rome was very new. And after Constantine's victory, he has this, it's called the Edict of Tolerance, but he says it in Milan, which is a city in Italy. So we now call it the Edict of Milan in 313. And he's officially saying that in Rome, Christianity will be tolerated. People were very shocked. People were very shocked at this. And to make it even more interesting for Constantine, he is now Christian kind of on the DL, the down low, and he builds a Christian church outside of the walls of Rome called St. Peter's Basilica, which ends up becoming the Vatican. So the Vatican is where the Pope lives. Like the Vatican for Christianity is second in importance, possibly to just Jerusalem, where Jesus was supposed to be born. Constantine not only tolerates Christianity, but he actively becomes a Christian emperor. The last thing I want to say about Constantine is, as you guys know, Diocletian split the Roman Empire into east and west, but Constantine wanted to establish a capital, 
and he calls it Constantinople. On this map, it says Constantinopolis. Opolis is the Latinization. I believe it means city in Latin if you think like metropolis, you know, like, like a city. So anyway, Constantinople is what we call it in English, but in Latin it was Constantinopolis. And <clears throat> he moves a lot of the resources, including the capital of the Roman Empire, to Constantinople. From Rome, through Greece, and up here to Constantinople. This was a much better place. It really was. This was a much better place to have a capital. It was in the middle of the empire. So we have the north of the empire up here in Europe. And then we have the south of the empire being northern Africa. We also have, obviously, the west part with where Rome is, but the east. The Roman Empire had expanded into the Middle East. So Constantinople was an extremely strategic location. It was also very important for trade routes. It was the one of the only ways that you could get from uh, the Middle East or over here, over way off the screen to Asia to Europe via a like land caravan, right? So you could go by boat, but if you're hauling things on horse or camel, the best way to go would be through Constantinople. This ends up bringing about the fall of Rome. This was only one of the things, which is what you guys are going to be reading about. There are about eight reasons why Rome, what we say falls, Rome Rome just becomes less powerful. When we say Rome falls, we mean it becomes less powerful to the point of not being what it used to be. Okay. These are the points that you guys are going to be reading about. So I'll just go over them really quick here. We have the invasions of the barbaric tribes, the Goths, Visig Visigoths, and the Vandals. Vandals going and invading and ruining a city. That's where we get the term vandalism. There was economic trouble. As we said before, there was the issue of where tax is going to go, trying to make everything the same price with Diocletian caused inflation, even though it was trying to stop inflation. Number three, the rise of the Eastern Empire. So as Constantinople got more powerful, the whole of Rome kind of gets weaker. Overexpansion and overspending on military, like I said with Diocletian, the military was where most of the money was going. And you kind of have to ask yourself, to what end? To what end is getting more land? You know, is it really important to expand for what? You did this for what? <laughs> um, number five, the government corruption and political instability. Like we saw, Diocletian tried to create the Tetrarchy. And it didn't work. Const Constantine was the sole ruler. And then just like we saw with our good, bad, and crazy emperors, having only one ruler can cause some issues. There was also the arrival of the Huns from Mongolia. So, the, so Rome is being attacked not only by European tribes, the nomadic kind of people, we would call, well, they would call by barbarians, but we know better now. The Huns from, it's like right above modern day China, below Russia and above China is where Mongolia is. And the Huns would come and attack Rome as well, the Roman Empire. Uh, the next is the rise of Christianity. When Constantine has that Edict of Milan, it really changes the culture of Rome. And the Rome as we knew it with the, stat the nude statues, the tolerated open homosexuality of some of the emperors, the kind of like spending on the luxurious life, th that is in real contrast to the traditional values of Christianity, which again we'll talk about next class. And the next is just the weakening of just the entire Roman legions. Rome Rome kind of falls off the map. And this is what I want you guys to read about. So we're going to end here for the day. 
and we will pick back up. Like I said, we're going to be going back in time a little bit next class talking about the early Christians.